Well, welcome to session four of the book of Colossians. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse 9 uh, down to verse 14 over the course of two sessions. And uh, we're actually going to tie in uh, verses 21 through 23 as well. Uh, Paul kind of <clears throat> creates this interlude uh, as he talks about this incredible, and this inc I mean, it is so incredible, verses 15 down to verse 20, this incredible uh, declaration of who Jesus is. And we're, we're going to want to focus in on that very specifically uh, so in this session, I want to look at verse 9 through 11, and then in the next session, uh, I want to look at verses 12 through 14, and then also 21 through 23, because Paul kind of picks up that thought uh, in verse 21 through 23 and kind of continues it uh, after he gets out of that uh, statement about Jesus. So just to kind of like set the stage, uh, I want to read verses 9 through 14 with you just so we can get it in our context, in our mind, and uh, just looking at this. So this is what Paul says in uh, Colossians 1, 9 through 14. Uh, he says, for this reason also, since today we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you would be filled with the full knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What an incredible passage. Uh, what I'd like to do is just again walk through this passage with you. Uh, again, Paul says that for this reason, since the day that we heard, so again, he's referencing back to what we talked about last time, where Epaphras has been sharing about um, all that the Colossians have been grabbing a hold of, this, the faith that they have, the love that they have, the hope which is secured for them, this gospel that they are living out. And so Paul says in verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard, we haven't ceased to pray for you, and we would ask that you would be filled with the full knowledge of his will. Uh, it's interesting that word field uh, is the Greek word pleiro. And the idea is outside content coming to fill something up. Uh, so imagine you have a, a, a pitcher and you take the pitcher and you dump it into a glass and you fill that glass up. Uh, that's this idea. And so when you, when you look at this, it has this idea to be filled completely up, to be fully equipped or to be controlled by. And so Paul is saying, hey, would you... And would you just be completely full? Would you just be completely consumed, overwhelmed, controlled by the full knowledge of his will? Uh, speaking of this word, uh, Warren Wiersbe says this. He said, this word used to describe a ship that was ready for a voyage. The believer has in Christ all that he needs for the voyage of life. Again, it's this idea of cargo. You have this outside content, you move it into the ship, and now the ship is ready for its voyage. And when that ship is completely full, that's this idea. Now, Paul says, <clears throat> I want you to be filled up to the full with, and he uses three words for knowledge. He says, with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we're going to be getting into this as we get into chapter 2 uh, in, in some studies from now. But it's interesting that one of the seeds that was kind of beginning to birth itself in this time period was that of Gnosticism. Uh, again, Gnosticism was all wrapped up in knowledge. It was all about uh, secret stuff. It was all about uh, that the, the physical is bad, the, the mental and the spiritual is good. And it was a distortion. And again, there's several books uh, in the Bible that are retorting and going against that whole concept. Uh, for example, 1 John is really big against the Gnostics. Well, at this time of the writing, it's, the Gnostics haven't really taken, uh, it hasn't come to a big fruition. It's not as huge. Uh, the scholars just kind of say that the seeds of that thought process, that philosophy, was beginning to take root. So as such, <clears throat> Paul seems to be hinting and hitting even that idea in its inception. And it's interesting that when you look at what the Gnostics would often talk about, they would always or often talk with these three words from the Greek. This idea of knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. 
So they would use these words and say, wow, we're all about this super knowledge. Hey, we're all about wisdom. Hey, we're all about understanding. And I love what Paul is doing, <clears throat> even before he gets into the chapter 2 stuff. And again, uh, we'll deal with this more as we get into chapter 2 and, and the, the problems that was circling around in these false teachings. But even here, Paul is saying, do you realize that I am praying that you would be filled up with this, and he uses all the words that the Gnostics would be using, but he's speaking about it in terms of Jesus. So he's not saying that there's these philosophies, I want you to be filled up with philosophy. Ooh, I, want, I want you to just have a whole bunch of information. As he's talking about this knowledge and spiritual wisdom and understanding, he's ultimately talking about Jesus in the context. And so I love the fact that Paul is just blasting through this whole Gnosticism stuff. And he's blasting through this idea of, hey, we're not just about information. Paul says we are after something far greater than the information. We are after the one that all the information points to, which is Jesus Christ. And you see that really coming to fruition in verses 15 down to verse 20, when Paul says that Jesus is ultimately, <laughs> he is to be all things in all time, in all places. Uh, so again, we're, we're looking at this idea in verse 9, and Paul says, hey, would you be filled up with this knowledge and spiritual wisdom and understanding? Now, really quickly to look at each of those words, the word knowledge there is epinosis. And the way it's often understood is this idea of super knowledge or this idea of full knowledge. And again, this was one of those favorite words of the Gnostics. And they were constantly talking about the epinosis and that, ooh, hey, I have this secret special epinosis for you to know. And yet Paul is saying, hey, there is an epinosis. And so he's not, he's not downplaying it. He just, he's lifting it even higher, saying, do you know what the epinosis is all about? It is all about Jesus. And in the context here, he talks about the fact that, hey, would you be filled up? Would you be just overflowing with this epinosis, this super knowledge of God's will? Isn't it a fun thought to think that God's will is knowable? That we can, in fact, know God's will? That he's not just hiding his will, it's He's, he's making it evident. In fact, there are several key passages in Scripture that clearly say this is the will of God. For example, Thessalonians say that your sanctification is God's will for your life. And another passage talks about purity, that, that sexual integrity is, is God's will for your life. That we are not to look like the world around us. You and I are supposed to look like Jesus that that is God's will, that as Romans 8, uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 28 and 29 says, that he's using all things in our life to conform us to the image of Christ. So what is God's will for you? Your, your life is to, is to look like Jesus, that it's not to be focused on yourself, and this isn't about you and, and your dreams and your wants and your whatever. This is, hey, would you submit your will under the will of him and say, God, whatever you want from my life, I'm in. Because ultimately what he wants for you is so good because he wants you to look like Jesus in this world. Again, you don't become Jesus. You do not become God. Hey, we understand that. But do you realize that his life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as his spirit comes into your life, he is forming and shaping you to look like Jesus. And Paul says, I, I want you to be filled up. I want you to have a full understanding, a super knowledge of that reality of his will. And so many of us are so lost and so confused and trying to figure out God's will for our life. Wouldn't it be amazing if you and I could be filled up with this full knowledge, this super knowledge of his will, which ultimately is all about Jesus. Oh, that, I, I want that. <laughs> I, want, I don't want to just be, I don't want to trickle. I don't want to drop. I, as Paul would say, I want a full, filled up knowledge, super knowledge of that will. Now, he also uses the word spiritual wisdom and understanding. Uh, the word wisdom there is the Greek word Sophia. Uh, and it's not just a pretty girl's name, but it means the practical know-how which comes from God. Sometimes it's used as the deep things of God. And it's interesting that Paul uses this word six times throughout the book of Colossians. Uh, wisdom is often said this is the practicality of knowledge. So knowledge is knowing what to do. Wisdom is the practical application of it. Uh, in some ways it's used in Scripture. It's this idea of it's this revelation of the deep things of God. 
In, in other words, it's not just the surface stuff. This is like the profundity of God's life and will and word for you. Uh, this is the word that shows up in James. In, in James chapter 1, verse 5, James says this, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you think you're lacking wisdom, all you got to do is ask God because he just generously, without reproach, overwhelmingly just gives you wisdom. Uh, Paul will use this word later on in chapter 2 to talk about the fact that these false teachers that are swirling all this nonsense in Colossae, they have an appearance of wisdom, that it looks like wisdom, and yet Paul says there's nothing to it. Wouldn't it be neat to actually have the real thing? That when you reach out and grab the reality of his wisdom, it's not just like grabbing jello, but you're actually grabbing something that is useful for living. That it's the practicality that, that as, as I am filled up with this super knowledge, this full knowledge of his will, it's not just, oh, I got good information. Now I'm knowing how to take that and practically apply that into the everyday moments of my life. That's this idea of the wisdom. And then he says not just spiritual wisdom, but also this idea of spiritual understanding. And that word understanding means this ability to understand the meaning or an importance of something. It's the clear analysis and decision-making in applying knowledge to various problems. <clears throat> Again, this is the application of knowing something. See, I, I know a lot of people who have a lot of head knowledge but are dumber than a rock. <laughs> it's because their lives are miserable, that they're not actually applying anything that they're learning. So, so they keep gaining information but they don't apply that information. Uh, classic example. Uh, for years, <laughs> for years, uh, one of my favorite kinds of books to read, uh, I love to read books. I read books all the time. I'm a voracious reader. And one of the favorite kind of books I used to read was health books. I used to love health books. And I knew all the techniques, and I knew all the health stuff, and I knew the exercises. But I would look at myself in the mirror, and I'd say, buddy, <laughs> you, you have a lot of good information, but it ain't doing much for you. And it wasn't until this past year that I'm like, okay, well, I'm done playing the games. I'm done just knowing information. I'm going to start living this thing out. And, and I started going to the gym. And I'm, I'm slowly working my way <laughs> in that direction. But see, I, I don't want to just have head knowledge of Jesus. I don't want to have just information about the Word of God. I want to practically apply it into my life. I want it to be demonstrated in the, in the reality and the practicality of my life. And so Paul is saying again in verse 9, <clears throat> he says, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you, and I'm asking that God would fill you up with this overwhelming information, this knowledge of his will, but not just the knowledge of it, but being able to practically apply that in wisdom and understanding. You're living this out uh, to the fullness I loved what uh, D.L. Moody said about this idea. He said, every Bible should be bound in shoe le leather. And the idea was, is it's, not just, it's not just an information book. This is not just a thing that we nod our heads along. Yes, amen. Uh, this isn't just something, you know, we, we, you know, we make doilies and put refrigerator magnets on our thing. Th this, is, this is for life. And so Moody says, see, this thing should move out of just being a book and should actually grab some feet and begin to live its life in your shoes. So every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. That this thing should become practical in your life. Is that true for you? Are you just a person full of the head knowledge? Uh, you've done all the Bible quizzing. You know the right answers. You know when to stand up. You know when to sit down. You, you know the religious stuff. But when someone was actually, if, if they were to actually analyze your life, they would have to come to the conclusion I, I don't see the evidence of this stuff. See, I want the fullness and the reality of this book to be evident in my life. Oh, I want that so bad, and I want that for you too. Uh, look at verse 10. In verse 10, Paul makes a shift, and he says, so that. He says, so that. So the whole reason why I want you to be filled up and full with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding is so that, and he gives four things listed in verse 10. He says, so that, one, you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Two, that you would please him in all respects, 
Three, you would bear fruit in every good work. And lastly, you would multiply in the full knowledge of God. So I want to walk through these really quickly uh, with you. Number one, again, is to walk worthy of the Lord. Uh, That word there, worthy, is a really intriguing word. Uh, It's that ancient word for a scale. So I don't know if you've ever seen those old scales that have like a plate on this side and a plate on this side, and you, you put a weight here, and it goes, funk, you know, and you got to put something on here. And when it levels itself out, it's now deemed worthy. That's this word. And so the idea of what Paul is saying is <clears throat> that your life is to be worthy of something. So we're going to put your life on one side, and on the other side, we are going to put Jesus. <laughs> so look at this that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So you're you're on one side, Jesus is on the other. Are they worthy? Do they actually equal each other? Now, I don't know about you, but if you put my life on one side and you put Jesus on the other, uh, they're they're not equal. (laughs) They're more like conk. Because my life does not look like Jesus. My life is so unworthy. My life is, it just pales in comparison to the reality of Jesus. So then what hope do I have to be living this life that's worthy of the Lord? So if I'm to live, that, that idea of walking, right, that I'm to walk, or the, really the idea is to live, that I'm to live worthy of the Lord, well, how is that going to happen? Here's the idea. The only way that my life will ever be worthy of the Lord is when the Lord himself, Jesus, invades my life through his indwelling Holy Spirit. So when the God of the universe comes and indwells my life through his overwhelming, powerful spirit, then do you realize that it's no longer me living my life for Christ? Woo! Isn't he lucky? Now it's him wanting to live his life in and through me. Oh, that's amazing. So now, by his grace, by his enablement, by his indwellment of his spirit, right, that fullness of the gospel that we talked about last time, as he now lives in my life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he is conforming and shaping and transforming my life to look like him. So, hey, everything that's happening in my life, everything that I'm thinking, everything that I'm saying, everything that I'm doing, he's, he's walking through everything in my life saying, <clears throat> that, that has to go. Because that doesn't look like me. So can, can I change that area of your life? Hey, can I transform this? Hey, would you just let me get a hold of this area? Hey, you, you have this addiction. Could you just let me in the middle of this addiction and just let me go crazy with it? Because I want to transform that area to look like me. And again, he's conforming us. He's sanctifying us. He's making us holy. He's radically changing us to look like Jesus. So again, here's Jesus and here's me on the scales. And the only way that we could ever live worthy, I am unworthy of him. I can never live his life. I will never be able to pull off the reality of this word on my own. Well, then what hope do I have? Is it possible for the God of the universe who is over here on the scale, could he invade my life through his spirit? And when his spirit gets inside of my life, he begins to do something in my life that allows me to live worthy of him in this world. See, that's this idea. So Paul is saying, hey, the whole reason I am praying that you would just be filled up to the fullness of this knowledge of his will, and not just the information, but the practicality of living that out in wisdom and understanding, is so that his life would be demonstrated in yours, that your life would be lived worthy of the Lord. What an incredible idea. I want that. Oh, I want that. Is it possible for God to come into your life and to take everything that does not look like him, every attitude, every thought, every action, every word, and begin to so transform it, to so sanctify it, to to so deeply change who you are, that it's not just you, you, your nature is being changed, that the things that you used to love, you now begin to hate, and the things you used to hate, you now begin to love, and, and it's so radically changing you. In fact, you'd be so radically changed, as Paul would say, that we would have to look at you and go, "Woo! you are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. That yeah, you look the same, and you smell the same, but you are not the same. Because God has, has done something so radical in you, that just as he spoke light into the midst of darkness in the first creation, 
So he has taken you in your old nature of rebellion and hatred toward God, and he's so revolutionizing and transforming and sanctifying you that you are so different. You, your nature has been completely altered that the only description we have for you is you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Oh, man, that's phenomenal. And it is possible, according to Paul, that you and I can live worthy of the Lord not because of our wisdom, not because of our strength or our own ability, but because we have the living God inside of us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way you and I can live worthy of the Lord, is to have the Lord inside of us. Oh, oh it's incredible. So the first thing he says is, hey, the whole reason for the knowledge thing is so that we might live in a manner worthy of the Lord. It's interesting when you look at that idea of walking worthy uh, it shows up three times, that, that word worthy actually shows up six times in the New Testament. Three of those is in that idea of to walk worthy. Uh, for example, Ephesians 4.1 says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Our passage says, walk worthy of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says, walk worthy of God. Uh, that word worthy shows up in Philippians, uh, and it's a different word. He uses the word conduct. Uh, it's a similar concept, but it's an entirely different word. But he says, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel. And then he uses that word worthy two other times, but kind of in some different contexts. But is it interesting that this idea of living the life of God in your world is not just here. It shows up in several different places. So again, that, that's the first thing uh, that he uses in the passage. That's the first so that. Uh, the second one is this. It says, to please him in all respects. Uh, that word to please him has this idea of a desire to please. Or as one person translated it, it's a preference of the will of others before our own. In other words, it's to take our will and our desires and our passions and to submit them before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I, I want your will and your pleasure over mine. See, I, I want to choose what you would have for me rather than what I want to do. And isn't it interesting that, that if I would seek him and go after him, he would give me the desires of my heart, but it's because my desires have been so submitted to him that his desires become my desires. And so he's going to give me the desires of my heart because they're his desires. Uh, maybe a, an illustration may help. Uh, I don't know if you ever had a dog, but dogs just have this overwhelming desire to please the master. They just have this overwhelming delight and desire to, to come and to just to serve and to, to lick the master's hand and just, oh, what do you want? And oh, here you are. And, and you, could, you could walk out of the house for five minutes, come back in, and it's like, wow, you've been gone all day. Wow, where have you been all my, all my life? And wow, this is incredible. What do we need to have that with Jesus? That Paul would say that, oh, we would please him in all respects, that in everything that we did, we would have this overwhelming desire that it was never about us, it was always about him. Oh, God, how can I serve you? Oh, God, what can I do for you? Oh, man, God, I have such a privilege of being called a Christian. And, and how do you want to use my life today? And how do you want to use my lips today? And oh, God, how, are you gonna, how do you want to use me today? And wouldn't it be neat if we were like the dog to the master, him being the master, us being the dog? I mean, our whole delight was in just serving him. Our whole delight was in just his pleasure. Our whole delight was just, oh, what can make his day in? Uh, there was this ancient uh, lady who, would, who, who wrote some books back in the Middle Ages. And uh, uh, she, made, she made this statement once that just has really stuck with me. She said, oh, my whole desire is to be a rag doll for Jesus. Of course, in that day, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. And it's the Middle Ages. And, and so what they would do is take, they would take the old rags, dish towels. You know, they would tie, tie a little, put a little string on the top, make it look like a head. And make some like little arms and legs. And so they would take old dish towels and, and make little dolls for, for little girls. And so this writer said, oh, God, my whole desire is that I'd be a rag doll for you. She says, if I could just give you pleasure, if I could just put a smile on your face for one single day, and then you, if you took me and you threw me off into the corner and you would never look at me again, I would count my life worthy to be lived because of that one moment of giving you pleasure as a rag doll for Jesus. 
See, would you have that kind of desire? Would you have that same kind of fervor that just says, Lord, I, hey, use me in big ways, use me in small ways. I don't care if I'm seen or not seen. I, I don't care if I'm ever known or not known. I don't care if my name's ever on a book. I don't care if anybody knows who I am. God, I just, my whole desire is to please you. And if you can use this little life and if you can use my little mouth in any way that you desire, Lord, I am in. Because as Paul says, I want to please you in all respects. See, do you have that kind of consumption? Do you have that same kind of drive and desire for Jesus? Uh, Paul says not just to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, not just to please him in all respects, but number three, to, to bear fruit in every good work. Uh, Paul uses this idea of bearing fruit and multiplying, which he uses in this passage. He said this back in verse 6. That what, what is the gospel doing? The gospel is causing this bearing of fruit and multiplication to be happening. And here he is in verse 10 saying, well, the knowledge of God is coming into your life and you're being filled up and full of all this and you're practically applying this in your everyday living so that, well, one of those so that's is so that you would bear fruit in every good work. So in everything that I'm doing, I'm doing it so that I would please him. And my whole delight is just that, that I would be consumed and overwhelmed with the reality of Jesus. But Paul says it's not just, not just to please him, but to also bear fruit in every good work. Which then begs the question of, well, what kind of fruit are we supposed to bear? And this is not an exhaustive study, but I just want to give you a few uh, insights or maybe uh, thoughts that I have found when it comes to this idea of bearing fruit in Scripture. Uh, fruit is all over, all, all over Scripture. Uh, obviously, it's an agra agrarian society, and so and a lot of Jesus' parables had to do with harvesting and, and food. Uh, Paul is obviously talking a lot about bearing fruit because it's that kind of a culture. And it's interesting as you do kind of a study of fruit throughout Scripture, and again, this is not exhaustive, but here's just some things that, that I just wanted to list in terms of ahas when it comes to this idea of bearing fruit. So if we are called to bear fruit in every good work, what does that look like? So here's just some thoughts and conclusions. Number one, uh, bearing fruit is in keeping with repentance. So in Matthew 3, 8, John the Baptist says, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So obviously there's this idea of repentance in association of bearing fruit. Or when we live a life of repentance, we'll be bearing fruit. Another one is fruit production isn't the same for everyone. In other words, if, if I'm bearing fruit, it may not look exactly like how much fruit you bear. It's interesting, in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, Jesus is talking and he says that, you know, the good seed fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. So it's all good seed, and yet the amount of fruit production that comes out of that was different for each plot. So again, I, I cannot take my, the fruit of my life and how much is being produced out of my life and look at yours and go, well, I don't, I don't have as much as yours. See, but I am to be bearing fruit. But again, I'm not to be measuring mine against yours. Another one is this idea of to bear fruit, we must hear the word of God with an honest and good heart and hold it fast with perseverance. So in Luke's account of the parable of the sower, listen to what uh, Luke records from Jesus. Jesus says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So it seems like there's something really important about if we're going to actually bear the fruit, well, we must hear the word with an honest and good heart, and we have to hold it fast with perseverance. Uh, there's also this idea that the secret to bearing fruit is in the abiding. So when you look at John 15, Jesus is given this incredible parable about the fruit, and he says, hey, you are to bear fruit. But look at what verse 4 and 5 says. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit from itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, there's this phenomenal idea that uh, when you look at the John 15 passage, Jesus is saying, hey, there is a job description of the branch. You're a branch. And hey, I'm the vine. I'm the life source. Well, then what is the job description of the branch? And most people who I ask that question to say, oh, bear fruit. We are to bear fruit. And that is true. Fruit's going to come out of our lives. But that is not the job description. 
according to Jesus, the job description of a branch is to abide. Uh, that word abide, it's the Greek word minnow. It has this idea to uh, sink down into, has this idea of to rest, has this idea of to cling. Uh, my favorite definition is to refuse to depart. So what is a branch supposed to do? Uh, here's this vine, here's a branch. The branch is in the vine. And the, and the whole purpose of the branch, the whole job description of the branch is to cling to that vine, to hold tight to the vine, to refuse to let go of the vine because the vine is the life source. And if the branch doesn't have the life source, hey, it will not do anything. It can't do anything. In fact, it's only good for the burn pile, says Jesus. But if you are abiding in the vine, oh, you will produce fruit, guaranteed. So if you want to produce fruit, as, as our passage says, well, the secret to bearing fruit then, according to Jesus, is you've got to abide in the very life of Christ. That this isn't about you gritting your teeth and trying to pull off fruit. This is, hey, would you just rest? Hey, would you just cling to? Would you refuse to depart from the life source, which is Jesus? Hey, he is the vine. He's the one that's going to give all the nourishment. He's the one that gives all the strength. He's the one that gives all the ability. He's the one that's producing the fruit in and through you. You've just got to hold tight to him and refuse to depart. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, another idea is this abiding in God allows us to bear fruit for him. So in Romans 7, 4, it says, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So the reason we're abiding in the vine is to produce fruit, but we're not just producing fruit. The fruit is for God, says Paul. Uh, the, next very, the next verse in Romans 7, 5 gives us the opposite of that. So if we live in sin and the flesh, it only produces fruit for death. So here's what Romans 7, 5 says. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So if we're in Christ, abiding in Christ, we're going to produce fruit for God but if we live out of ourselves, if we're living out of our own resource and our own ability, out of our own wisdom, out of our own fleshly inclinations and desires, well, it only produces fruit for death. So your life is going to produce fruit. The question really is, what kind of fruit is it going to produce? Now, as you come into Galatians chapter 5, we have a definition of the two kinds of fruit. So again, if you're living out of your flesh, this fruit of death, this fruit of the flesh, Paul describes as this. This is Galatians 5, 19 through 21. He says, now the deeds or the fruit of the flesh are evident. Which are these? And he gives you the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if I'm living out of myself, I'm living out of my own abilities, out of my own selfish inclinations, the only thing that's going to come out of me is this fruit of death, this fruit of the flesh. But if I abide in the Spirit of God, Paul says, what's going to come out of me is the fruit of the Spirit. So in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And to sum up the fruits of the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 9 says, For the fruit of the light, speaking about Jesus, He is the light. So the fruit of Christ consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So if you're going to look at the fruits of the Spirit, well, what you conclude then is, well, they're all summed up in goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then Philippians 1.11 tells us that fruit comes through Jesus Christ. Again, I am not producing it myself. It all comes through him. And then Philippians 1.11 says this. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What an incredible reality that you and I are to bear fruit. Well, what kind of fruit? Not just any kind of fruit, because the fleshly selfishness and sin of our life is going to bear a fruit of death. But you and I are to bear a fruit of righteousness, a fruit unto God, through God. And that very fruit is going to be the evidence of His life. That when you look at the fruits of the Spirit, these are the fruits of the Spirit. That it's His life 
be manifested and birthed in you. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. That's who he is. That's the very life of Christ within. So do you understand that what Paul is saying is, is that, hey, you are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Hey, you've got to have him inside of you. Hey, you've just got to get wrapped up in the reality of his life. And everything that you do is just to please him. Oh, that the delight of your heart is just to serve and delight yourself in him. And everything you do and every good work is to just bear fruit, which is, really, is a demonstration of his life. And lastly, it has this idea. Oh, I still have some more. Oh, let me read these ones. These are fun. Sorry, I went through all the fruit things. So here's some more things on fruit. Uh, Hebrews 12, 11 says, Discipline, uh, though painful, trains us and produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So l- listen to what Hebrews 12, 11 says. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, but to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Isn't that incredible? That, that all the discipline and difficulty is helping us produce more and more fruit. And I think this is the last one. James 3, 17 through 18 That God's wisdom is full of good fruit and is sown by peacemakers. So James 3 says this, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruits. So think about this. The the wisdom from above, the wisdom from God, is full of good fruits. Without doubting, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, that is such an incredible list about fruits. I forgot about those last two. Sorry about that. Uh, so again, the last one here, so number one is uh, walking worthy of a man or the Lord. Number two is to please him in all respects. Number three is to bear fruit in every good work. And lastly, number four, is to multiply or to increase in the full knowledge of God. And again, it's interesting that that word knowledge is that word epinosis. It's that super knowledge or that uh, superior full knowledge. So Paul is saying in verse 9, I'm praying that you be filled up full with this full knowledge, this super knowledge, and make it practical in the living through wisdom and understanding. Not just that, but I, I want you, as he says here, that I want you to be increasing in the full knowledge, this super knowledge of God. Here's my question. How is that possible? If I am filled up to the full of this super full knowledge of God, how on earth can it multiply and increase? And I have no idea, but I want it. <laughs> if it is available, I want this reality. That somehow, if this superior, super, full knowledge of God and his will could somehow increase and expand in my life, I want that. Don't you? That's amazing. Now, Paul moves from that idea And he gets into verse 11 and he says this, Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience with joy. So he's kind of wrapping up this idea of, hey, I want you to be filled up with the knowledge of God. And hey, I want your life to to have this reflection of Jesus, that you're walking worthy of him. Everything is for his delight, that there is this fruit of his, of his nature that is being evidenced in you, and somehow, and I don't know how to explain this, but somehow this full knowledge of God is increasing in your life. But how is all of that going to take place? How on earth is that even possible for that to take place? Well, it seems like verse 11 answers that. He says that you are being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. The word strengthened uh, is this word uh, dynamu, which is this idea of this overwhelming resource enabling and strengthening you. And that is being done through his his all power. So you're strengthened with all power. The word power there is the word dunamis, and you've heard this so many times, Uh, but the word dunamis is the expressive, it's where we get the word dynamite, it's it's this explosive, it's this energetic, it's this uh, God has resource and ability, but when that resource and ability is demonstrated, that is the word dunamis. So it's interesting that I'm dynamoed by his dunamis, that I am being really strengthened and enabled and made strong in my life through his overwhelming resource and power with, it says, according to his glorious might. And that word might is another word for power. It's this word krotos, and it has this idea of might and sovereignty and authority and kingly power. It's that, that idea. 
So according to his glorious sovereignty and authority and kingly uh, ability and might and dominion, according to that reality, he is taking his overwhelming resource and he's moving that in your life and he's strengthening you. He's enabling you to do the very thing that you cannot do. Isn't that incredible? And again, that goes back to the whole thing that we've been talking about. That what would it look like if the God of the universe came to indwell your life through his spirit? And his spirit is now, through his grace, is enabling you and strengthening you and, a, and enabling you to live out the life that you, in and of yourself, could never, could never live. See, that's the reality of Christianity. This is not about what you can do for him as much as it is, oh, what does he want to do in and through you? So would you allow yourself to be strengthened with his overwhelming power according to his sovereignty and kingly authority and ability? See, he wants to do something mightily through your life. And Paul concludes verse 11 for saying this, so that we might attain. Hey, so the whole reason that he's strengthening you, hey, the whole reason that he's just enabling you, hey, the whole reason that he's just flowing his mighty resource in your life is so that we might attain, we might have, grasp, steadfastness and patience with joy. Steadfastness with patience with joy. How that word steadfastness is the uh, Greek word hupomone, incredible word. It's this idea, uh, it's the power to withstand hardship or stress. It's inward fortitude, it's endurance, it's patience. It's to deal triumphantly no matter what life throws at you. <clears throat> uh, we've often talked around here about this idea of tinsel strength, uh, which is not the stuff you put on Christmas trees. Uh, tinsel strength is the measurement of a rope. So the amount of weight and pressure a rope can hold before it snaps, that's its tinsel, tinsel rating. So if I put a big weight at the end of a rope, and it can hold it for five minutes, that's its tinsel strength. What God, think about this, what God is doing in our life is increasing our tinsel strength, that he is enabling us with his overwhelming resource and power, according to his authority and sovereignty and dominion, he is strengthening us, why? So that we would have greater hupomone, this greater endurance, a greater fortification, a greater ability to withstand greater and greater difficulties. You and I need that. Uh, when we look at the world today, things are getting crazier and crazier. And again, we don't have it like the Middle Ages. We, we live in such easy days. I, I get that. But the reality is, is the days in which we live, we still need hupomone. We need this tinsel strength. We need this ever-growing increase of ability. Isn't it interesting when, when David approached Saul about Goliath? The reason David said that he could tackle Goliath is because God has been, had been increasing his tinsel strength. And that's not the word that David used, but, but David says, Saul, do you not realize that when I was with my father's sheep, I dealt with lions and bears, and therefore I can handle the giant? And my guess is he probably didn't start with bears. He probably started with like bunny rabbits and squirrels, because you know, who starts with lions, who lions and bears? Uh, so here's David, you know, he's, he's out there, and he's dealing with squirrels and bunny rabbits, and then God's increasing his ability to handle greater difficulties. So he's handling foxes and, you know, possums and then wolves, and eventually he gets to the point where he's dealing with lions and tigers and bears. Oh, oh my. So much so that his tinsel strength, his hupomone had increased, where David says, hey, I can handle a giant. And then it's interesting, you get to the Psalms, and David says, even if 10,000 times, times 10,000 surround me, even then I shall not be afraid. And I'm like, David, are you insane? But it, it's, it's because God's increasing his hupomone. See, you and I need this in the world in which we live. That regardless of the pressures, regardless of the situations, regardless of who's president, regardless of what is going on around us, that we have a greater fortitude, a greater strength of soul that we can handle any pressure that life may throw at us and we come out triumphantly, victoriously with a smile. See, that is the reality of what God is producing in us through his strength. So his overwhelming resource is strengthening us so that we might grab a hold of and have this hupomone. Uh, I, I love this statement. It was one scholar defined hupomone this way. It means not only the ability to bear things, but the ability in bearing them to turn them into glory. It is a conquering patience or a steadfastness. 
uh, Charles Spurgeon said it this way, by perseverance, by steadfastness, by hupomone, the snail reached the ark. <laughs> That's a great statement. Because it would have taken a lot of fortitude, a lot of endurance for a snail to finally make its way onto that ark. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And then the other word that Paul uses is, in my translation, patience. But it's this idea of, it's the ability to patiently endure pain or unhappiness. It is the self-restraint which does not hastily retaliate. And it's often used as patience with people. And here's what one scholar said. He said, it is the quality of mind and heart which enables us to cope with people in such a way that their unpleasantness and malice and cruelty will never drive us to bitterness, that their unwillingness to learn will never drive us to despair, that their folly will never drive us to irritation, and their unloveliness will never alter our love. This word, and I don't know how to pronounce it, macrothumia, is a spirit which never loses patience with, belief in, and hope for others. That's an incredible idea. So think about this. The overwhelming ability and a might and dominion and sovereignty of the Lord is being dumped out and he is through his resource strengthening you with all power. Well, for what purpose? It's so that you become ever increasingly more fortified and ever more patient. And so when you look at these two words together, it's interesting. Paul says, I want you to have steadfastness, which is the fortitude and endurance no situation can defeat. And I want you to have patience, which is the patience and love no person can defeat. So get this idea. There's no situation and there is no person that will defeat you. That, that you will always walk in triumph and victory. That no matter what you face, no matter what person you encounter, you will always come out victorious and triumphant. Why? Because the overwhelming power of God has come within your life and is now strengthening you to live out the life that looks just like Jesus. That you are not doing it out of your own strength. You're not doing it out of your own resource. You're not doing it out of your own ability. You're doing it by and through him. And he concludes this whole thing by saying, with joy. <laughs> so this is not just, all right, I'll put up with my situations. I'll put up with my difficulties. I'll put up with that one person. And I'll just, I'll struggle through it. Oh, bless the Lord. Paul says that you are to do that. You are to have this steadfastness, this triumph over every situation. You are to have this patience, this bearing with love with every person. And you are to do both of those with joy. Well, how is that going to take place? Oh, because his overwhelming strength is going to come in and resource and be that enablement that you need. And he is going to be your joy, as Psalm 16 verse 11 says. That at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That he is the fullness of joy. So do you realize that what Paul is consistently saying in this incredible prayer is he's saying, hey, would you allow the overwhelming resource and the power and the might and the wisdom of God to fill you up? Would you allow your life to be the demonstration of Jesus to your world? Hey, hey would you allow your life to be lived in a manner worthy of the Lord? Hey, would everything that you do be pleasing unto him, that, that he would be your delight and your satisfaction, that you would just bear fruit, that you would bear his character in everything that you did, and that you would somehow multiply in this wisdom, and that his overwhelming resource could just fill you up so that your life would have the steadfastness and patience with joy. What an incredible reality. If I can summarize this whole thing, Paul is saying, we desperately need Jesus. And in the days in which we live, which is in some, some oddly ironic ways, so similar to those who are living in Colossae, we desperately need Jesus in our day. That this world does not need more people who call themselves Christians who merely have it out of their lips, but not demonstrating it out of their lives. See, we don't just need more people with head knowledge and, and who just, oh, I, I've got all the doctrinal information correct, but then their behavior is lacking. See, what would it look like to actually be a believer and a Christian in the days in which we live who fully live out this reality that it's not being done by our strength and our wisdom and our might, but by Him through the enablement of His Spirit who lives and dwells within us. Would you live in that reality? Would you let this not be about you, but be all about Him? 
Would you allow the, the impossible Christian life to somehow become possible in your life? Not because you suddenly figured out the trick, not because you have the wisdom, not because you somehow came up with some more muscle. It's because you have the God of the universe living inside of you, and that changes everything. Would you be strengthened by his strength to live out this life that he's calling you to live? Oh, what a phenomenal opportunity we have. Oh, that's amazing. I would like to invite you in the next study. Uh, we're going to be looking at the rest of this passage. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14. And then we're going to go down and look at verse 21 through 23. And again, I, I would just highly encourage you to join me in this study. Not just to, to listen to these messages, but to actually wrestle with the text yourself. And so as such, I've been providing some study guides and resource materials to, to help you get into this text and to actually learn how to study the Bible on your own. It's one of the most important things that I have ever learned in the last 20-ish years of, of taking God seriously in my life. And so if I can encourage you, don't just, don't just listen to these sessions. And again, if you only have time to listen, hey, thank, thank you for listening. I don't want to downplay that either. Appreciate your time. I really do. But I want, I want you to get in the Word. And so I invite you to, to join me in the study of this. And you, if you want some help, so if you want these study resources, they're absolutely free. I, I just want to make them available to you so that you can wrestle with the text. All you got to do is click the link that's below the video or the audio in, in the podcast player that you're listening to it on, and it'll take you to a place where you can sign up. But, but would you join me in just studying this incredible letter of Paul to those in Colossians? And again, if you want to study ahead, I encourage you to read the whole book uh, this week. It'd probably take you 15, 20 minutes. Read through chapter 1 a couple of times, but specifically focus on verses 9 through 14, and then again, verse 21 through 23. But let's end in prayer. I'm so excited with what God is doing in our lives. Because it's not us, it's him for his glory alone. Join me in prayer. Lord, we love you. How, oh, Lord, thank you <clears throat> that we could somehow be filled up with this full knowledge of your will. That you are not hiding your will from us. That you are not keeping it close to your chest. But you have made it so evident through your word. And that you are wanting to unveil it to us. So Lord, let us have a clear understanding of your will, not just in information, but in wisdom and understanding to practically apply it into our lives. So that we might live in a manner that is worthy of you. That everything that we do, we just, oh, we would do out of a delight to please you. That we would bear fruit in everything that we did and somehow we'd multiply in this overwhelming knowledge of who you are. Lord, strengthen us with your overwhelming power so that we might attain and grab a hold of steadfastness and patience, that we could be victorious and triumphant in every situation with every single person that we encounter with joy. Lord, we admit that this is not about us. This has never been about our talent or our wisdom or our ability of what we can do for you, but this has always been about what you are wanting to do in and through your people. And so, Lord, could you come to these weak, humble vessels and would you do something in and through us that would just be a demonstration to the world, the overwhelming glory and life of who you are. Lord, this world needs to see you, not us. And so, Lord, whatever it is that you need to do, anything that you need to change and transform and cleanse and, and purge from our lives, Lord, we want to we surrender our lives before you and say, have at it, Jesus so that our lives would be conformed evermore, sanctified evermore to the image of Christ. Lord, thank you for such a phenomenal reality. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In your precious, powerful name we pray. Amen.